This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, um, thanks very much. We're bringing the session to a close with this round table. My name is Claire Anderson and I'm the academic coordinator from the University of Leicester. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank Sujit um, and Zoe Laidlaw, who can't be with us today, who assisted with coming up with the academic speakers uh, for today. OK, we've, I thought what we, we could do is perhaps I'm, I'll spend a few minutes just running through some of the themes that I think have emerged from these really fascinating discussions that we've had today. And I very much hope that this will be a fully participatory session and that we can take forward some, I'm sure we won't have time to take forward all, but some of the ideas. So this is really in no particular order, but these are some of the things that have really struck me uh, today. The first thing which has been talked about a lot is digitization and the impact of digitization on how people use collections, uh, whatever kind of user they are, and also about how archives, the possibilities for linking archives across spaces, which of course, when we're thinking about global context, is something that's potentially uh, very interesting, challenging, um, and all those things. The second thing is about relationships and the relationships between various users of archives um, and various producers of history. We've had a discussion about academic historians, genealogists, volunteers, schools, community groups, and we've learned, I've learned a lot about various kinds of collaborations and challenges um, of different groups working together. And I would like to come back to volunteers in particular uh, a bit later on. The third thing that's really struck me, and this follows on very well from Margot's paper, is the idea of the UK as a really connected place globally. And it's very interesting to start thinking at the idea of the English country house as a space of connection rather than of English separation or distinctiveness. But I was also very taken with a comment that Dan made this morning, which is the need to be mindful of power and the need not to flatten uh, power relations when we talk about collection, uh, connections between different spaces. The fourth thing is about what the archive actually is. And we've had quite a lot of discussion about the need to widen the archive. Um, Andrew talked specifically about Anne-Laura Stoller's work along the archival grain, uh, where she also talks for us to really rethink, reconstitute what we mean by historical sources. I also am an avid purchaser on eBay. I think we should all come out of the closet. Um, on, on this front. I'm also very interested and have been in my most recent work in the idea of images as objects um, and things like postcard as an object and a circulating object. So I was, I was very <laughs> taken with, with that discussion earlier on. I could also add in this widening of, of the archive the importance of ethnographic work and observation of historical remnants and also political monuments to and uh, deriving from empire. Something we haven't talked about today at all, but something that is very interesting to think about is oral history and interviewing people, not just to fill in the gaps from the records, but actually about their sense of what their history is, who they are, how they are connected across um, different kinds of places. And the importance of place is key. Again, I was very sympathetic to Sujit's um, stressing that you have to go to places that you study. You know, it um, troubles me that even in this day and age, there are lots of people who work on places overseas who have never actually been there, um, more, more common than one might think. The next thing is to do with records and private papers, the official archive and the private archive. And I do think that there's been a slight um, lack of nuance in our distinction between the official archive and what that might and might not tell us, and the sort of liberatory possibilities of private papers. Um, I would like to sort of add a slight coda to that, which is that in my experience, non-UK archives do allow a kind of drilling down uh, into particular historical perspectives, but they don't always. So if we think of the French empire, for example, and the repatriation of records, 
that Michael mentioned. What was left behind and what was repatriated is actually exactly the same, just from a different department. Drilling down, you see, here we go, <laughs> just on cue. Um, you know, so I, I, I would feel quite anxious as somebody who's worked extensively overseas and in the UK at assuming that the non-European or the non-UK archive is somehow gives us access to a different kind of voice because it doesn't always. And the wonderful holdings at the National Archives never cease to amaze me with their nuance and layering of colonial perspective. Okay, global history. I don't think we've really talked about what we mean by global history at all. Well, we've kind of, it's been a little bit like the elephant in the, in the room for me. Sujit talked about lines, and we've also talked a little bit about nations as a collective, and most in the last panel about this relationship between the local and the global. This morning also, we talked about how uh, the global could allow local communities to think about who they are and how they're connected to each other and the rest of the world. But still, I don't think we've really got to grips with what, the glo what global history is. And we certainly haven't really got to grips with the kinds of circuits and connections that circumvent altogether Europe or perhaps are not centre, periphery centred or fo focused. Um, we haven't talked about Latin America. I was very interested in Catherine Eagleton's discussion of America, which was so important, as we all know, in trading networks in the Indian Ocean. So I really don't have any conclusions here, but it would may be something that we want to discuss. What do we mean by global history? Because, of course, that impacts in how we might want to use, as historians, global history archives and how archi archivists might consider and organise their collections. I think I'll, I'll end... Oh, no, there was... Uh, sorry, there was one other point. One other point. Sorry. Ar um, archives and objects, which I mentioned earlier... Another thing that has been discussed by several of, of um, our presenters and, and um, participants today has been the effect of physically going to an archive. And there is actually some very good social science work coming out now on affect and archives and about archives as tactile spaces and as the past as something you touch or at least you think you touch, that you're bridging the gap between the now and the then, which I think probably explains in some part the popularity of family history and why family historians continue to go to archives. Um, and actually the numbers of visitors to archives are going up, as Michael told us this morning, even as digitisation is widening um, the possibility of seeing documents from afar. And I just wanted to end with a very brief comment of taking a group of Warwick undergraduates um, to uh, visit a field trip to the ethnographic store of the British Museum where um, J.D. and Sarah's colleagues very kindly got out boxes and boxes of objects from the Andaman Islands, which is a particular interest of mine and which we were studying in the group. We also went to the anthropology library in the museum just up the road and looked at some very large photographic albums. And it was astonishing to me as somebody who works routinely and is perhaps a little bit dulled to the, the effect of the archives, to see how genuinely moved the students were. And some of the students became really genuinely emotional, not just at seeing these very old objects, but about thinking, thinking deeply about the power of the production of the collection and the looting, frankly, that went on in bringing these objects back to the UK. Um, and they, they, they became very engaged in a way that they had not been when we'd looked at the objects online, as we had done before we arrived. So I think I'll end there, and I'll open it out to the floor. Um, but I did say I wanted to come back to this idea of volunteers, and I wanted to introduce Janet McCalman to my left, who's the person on the panel that we haven't already met this afternoon. Janet runs a very large volunteer-based program in Australia at the University of Melbourne and I wondered if Janet wanted to discuss a little bit more the use and not the sorry the collaboration between academic partners archives and volunteers. Thank you Claire. Let's get this closer so we could try and overcome that and I'm suffering from a cold as well so it's going to be difficult. Um, 
The project that I'm part of is called Founders and Survivors, which is trying to trace what happened to the almost 70,000 men, women and children transported to Van Diemen's Land, now Tasmania, uh, as convicts between 1803 and 1853. The records about them that were made by, kept by the colonial government are probably the most detailed, the most intimate uh, and the most extraordinary records of human bodies and behaviour and lives of ordinary people anywhere in the 19th century world. And what we don't know about people who are transporters, what happened to them? And we also know very little about what where they came from, what were their lives before they were transported. We tend to see them just in the archive, just there in, in the record. We forget they have a life before and we knew very little about the life after. To do this, I, I wanted to try and harness all that talent that's out there in the community of people who've been doing family histories, uh, which is an enormous industry in any of the sort of former British colonies or the Anglophone world, um, particularly in Australia, where people quite often said nothing or very little or didn't tell the story of where they came from, often because of shame and stigma, uh, often because people left Britain uh, for quite peculiar reasons, because of broken marriages, because of, because of uh, scandals, because they'd gone broke, uh, and so on. So there's an enormous amount of hidden and concealed history which people are now bringing out and finding for themselves. And we've got all these people working hard away doing family history, and one day they finish their family history, so what are they going to do next? Well, they can come and work with us. But seriously, I felt there's all, as just as I was re resonated with what you were saying, um, there's this enormous amount of activity going on. Can we link this together? Can we make it a partnership? And so to try and trace what happened to the convicts, particularly since the, one of the best ways of surviving in life after sentence was to change your name, we were going to need their descendants who'd found them uh, through going back, coming back backwards from the present uh, and to work with them. So that's what we've been able to do and I think that by the end of this year we'll have traced about 30,000 and we've done that in three years with um, about 60 people, find a lot of people volunteered, but we asked them to do very difficult things. Not only were they doing genealogical tracing, they were going to have to read and interpret difficult and dense convict records to code those records because we were looking at the impact of the, the convict experience as a stress regime um, and to be doing quite careful research. One thing they needed to be was old, because most people under 65 in Australia can't read copper plate. It went out of Australian schools. Uh, very few of them had formal historical training. Many revealed themselves to be born historians. And as with Margot's project, we had workshops, we have a magazine, uh, we have conferences, we have involved them as colleagues. They have been enormously creative and in, in their uh, insights into the work. And it's been enormously rewarding. Lots of friendships, lots of mutual support. We've got people who have been very ill in the project. Um, and it has been just a wonderful example of how much capacity is there in the community and how much pleasure they've derived from being involved in our project. Thank you. So, really happy to open it out to the floor to discuss this element of the day or any of other points that you would like to raise or that I raised in my summary. Yeah, this sort of follows on from um, the comment that you've just made and also Margot's um, paper earlier. And I was just wondering about, um, where, I mean, there are certain places in the world where these sorts of projects can be done mm. and other places where they can't be done. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, I mean, Margot, your a really fa wonderful project is East India Company at home. What would it be if it was not at home? Would the project be doable um, if it was East India Company homes in India, for instance? It would, it would be fascinating to know um, what sort of obstacles that would <laughs> raise um, uh, for a collaborative project and would you get volunteers and what the volunteers would mm. think about it and so on. Mm. Um, so, I mean, is there a way in which certain sorts of global narratives, which necessitate volunteering, 
et cetera, uh, an interest in family history, could be done in certain places in the world and in certain sorts of contexts of collaboration, but not others at the moment. Yeah, it's a re really good uh, question. It's one I've thought about quite a lot. Um, I did a paper maybe a year ago um, at the Sorbonne, a version of which is actually up on the website as a think piece, in which I grappled with, at the end of it, the, with some of these questions. And I'll, I'll come back in a moment to the French response to this question, which adds another layer in, entirely. Um, it would be possible to do a princely houses and quasi-European elite houses um, of Indians in India about this. And there are some um, individuals, some scholars at Jadavpur University and Calcutta in particular, who are doing that kind of research. So one, one could braid together elite Indian princely houses um, and elite mercantile houses. Uh, there's some work, some good work by French scholars on Pondicherry and Pondicherry Europeanized furniture, etc. So one could do that project. It's not personally the one I would be particularly um, interested in doing. But of course, you have savage inequalities of access to uh, the ability to be a local or family historian in India compared to here. Um, you don't have those communities um, of historians, and that is very much. Um, a legacy, one could argue, of colonialism. So that is also the history of colonialism, is precisely in the ability, inability to do that history of colonialism. But, oh God, to go back to the, the French case, one of the things that was really interesting when I gave this paper there was that the French audience um, came back and said, oh, it's really very odd that you're doing this, and it's amazing you're able to do this. First of all, why don't your volunteers um, force you to pay them, um, shouldn't they, won't they strike if you're making them, extracting all of this labor from them, you know, without paying them? So that whole concept of the, the voluntary sector was very, very different. But the other thing that really surprised them, and it's the thing that I think we in the UK now take for granted and shouldn't, is um, the colleagues at the Savon said, our museums wouldn't be interested in, in working with us the way that museums in the UK are clearly interested in working with us. And I think we forget, I mean, if I were still a US academic, I wouldn't be able to work with all of these museums and all of these archives in this really rich way. So whatever you say about the funding regimes here, and they are deeply problematic, but they have opened up you know, really exciting new ways of working across collecting institutions. And I would include universities in collecting institutions, because we also collect knowledge and objects, and also produce them. This is obvious. Would it be better if we moved up even there? Would you be able to do it? Um, I think the, the other thing is that we, we've just been to a workshop in Amsterdam. We, we've just been at a workshop in Amsterdam where uh, it was revealing how many countries use volunteers for quite, often quite tedious work. So transcribing uh, obscure documents, but re vital registrations, censuses. So from Portugal um, through the Netherlands, uh, uh, in, and particularly obviously in Scandinavia. And we've worked quite closely with the people in Umeå, where they are certainly inspired by their d demographic database, which was done more than 20 years ago as uh, a, a work-making uh, program for the unemployed. Um, so. I think that volunteering is pretty widespread and you, I mean I think there's a different level of capacity perhaps in, in Britain. Um, we, we may not find quite so many people who could do stately homes in Australia. Um, but I, I'm impressed by how many of our researchers were people who'd never been to university uh, but were very literate um, and who had a, a real historical nose and historical imagination. And they, they're good detectives. But 
what this project relied on, first of all, we did have generous funding, uh, which enabled us to have some support staff. Secondly, we had key institutions that had digitised the records. Australia suffers, as always has, from the tyranny of distance, so digitisation has been critical to us. Uh, particularly the digitisation of first the convict records, which we in fact began for this with this project in 2007, um, with money from the Australian Research Council. Now, then the digitisation of the newspapers, which have been absolutely crucial, because for now we can actually see our ex-convicts and their families doing things all over the country. Um, the digitisation or the ability to purchase digitally death certificates, at least in, in two of the key colony, ex-colonies. Um, and finally, the digitisation of the World War I records. Uh, Australia fortunately has all its service records that have survived intact from World War I. Um, and then we've been linking the convicts to their descendants who served in the, in the, second, in the First World War uh, and went through a not dissimilar total institution where they did not dissimilar things in rebelling against authority, like running away and hitting people and getting drunk. I'm Caroline Shaw. I'm um, the archivist at Schroeder's, formerly at Rothschilds. Um, so I'm not a historian, so that's my apology at the beginning. Um, so thinking about global history today, for me, um, I've seen an aspect of it is this history of globalisation. And um, we've been talking, people have been talking about the movement of peoples, the movement of objects, uh, the movement of ideas, and indeed the movement of research, historical researchers around the world. But for me, sitting here, we're here in, the, in London, we're you know, stones throw from the City of London. So I just make a plea that the City of London is, uh, has the history of the movement of capital, invisible um, movement. A huge amount of capital sloshing through London and the bank archives of banks like Barings, Rothschilds and Schroders will give researchers uh, a connection to the internationalization of capital to South America Rothschilds in Brazil, uh, Bearings in Argentina, the American Railways, all of that funding coming through, uh, sloshing through London. And seeing the pictures this morning of the Colombo uh, breakwater, I think uh, the archives, these business archives, these bank archives are full of things like that, where people needed the money, and those records uh, are often just up the road in the city of London. So I'd, I'd just make a, a plea there for the bank archives. You might think that um, bank records are going to be difficult to understand, uh, difficult to access. That's not necessarily the case. And through going into the archive, you'll probably find things that you wouldn't expect to find there. Thanks very much. That's really helpful. I'd like actually to pass the mic over to Mike at the end, um, not just because he's a business archivist, but because I know that Mark had some comments that he wanted to make about access to archives more generally. Mm. Uh, thanks. Obviously, I endorse those previous comments. Um, I think sometimes there is a sense that um, you've, got to, you've got to steer clear of banks and the whole mechanism of capitalist oppression and uh, empire building. And in fact, you know, there are lots of really good things in those sources. Um, one of the things that um, has, has come up and uh, has been mentioned in uh, the introduction there is, is digitization. And um, a few people have said during the day that... Um, or oh, I'm very wary about mass digitization. Um, now, it, that, that, there seems to me there's a slight misunderstanding with what's going on there. The first is there's a distinction between born digital records and paper records that have been digitized. Okay, there's two different things. And what we're mainly dealing with here is, in effect, analog paper records that have been digitized. Now, as far as I know, no one is destroying the paper records. So anyone who's thinking, this race to digitization is a bad thing. You can still go to the Bank of England archive and actually view those records. And you can probably still go to the Bering archive and view the prospectuses and all these other places. So digitization for archivists is about access. And I think that's something I want to make really clear. It's about access. It's allowing people who might not be able to afford to go to London to look at records, who actually aren't academics, who don't get research grants. It's about access. And I think that's a really important point to make. Um, and the other thing is that actually in terms of access as well, digitization costs quite a lot of money. 
Uh, if I had £50,000, I would rather spend it on cataloging and getting information into a catalogue so people could see it's there before I would spend it on digitisation. Uh, obviously, there's a pressure to digitise. So those are just a few points about how that can help access. My hand shot up as you were <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Valentina Mirabella, I work at British Library, and I just want to follow up on that point about digitization because, as we know, mass digitization is basically an impossible thing to achieve because of costs and capacity as well. So, yes, we do give access, which is great, but we do give access to a selection of material. And so, uh, the curation and the selection ahead of a digitization project is pretty much a communication project. So, we say, what we want to say and what we digitize, what we want to highlight of a collection. So we are making an operation that is a communication intervention in itself. And it should be this aspect, I think, should be highlighted in conferences like this because it is quite an additional point to the profession of the archivist and the historian. And a couple of questions come out of this. <coughs> From an archivist, thank you, Rachel, perspective, I would like to ask you, what are your fears in communicating colonial archives, but just when it comes to digitizing them, because we can't digitize them all, them all, and we know that we can only highlight part of those documents, so are we going to give a biased version of the, of the story, or perhaps um, are we risking not to reflect the breadth of the material in the whole collections, or maybe are we... Of course, we are not going to digitize most often sensitive materials. So, is the fact that we are ignoring from the, the corpus that has been digitized sensitive material going to show that we perhaps are politically ignoring it? So, maybe do we have to justify that? And uh, from a researcher's point of view, I would like to know how these digitization projects curated by archivists and curators are received by historians and by researchers? Thank you. Really interesting set of points there. I would just like to chip in that around the choice of what to digitise. There, there were, in the old days, there were similarities before digitisation, before the internet. And I remember my first ever trip to the National Archives of India in the 90s. Before I went, I was really, not perplexed, but I had noticed that there was a huge amount of literature on a group called the criminal tribes, the so-called hereditary criminals of India. When I got to the National Archives of India, I realised that this was because there was a beautiful catalogue. Um, and the records at some point in the past had been disaggregated. And there was a criminal tribe set. So if you were a, a, a young graduate student, an early career researcher or a more senior researcher going into the archives, your topic was ready-made and packaged up. Whereas if you wanted to do research that cut across headings, which was the kind of work that unfortunately or fortunately I wanted to do, it was a lot more complicated. So without trying to detract from those really interesting points, I think that there, there have been similar challenges in the pre-digital age, um, in the way that collections are presented. And it, it goes back to the point um, that was raised this morning about how one needs to know what's in the archives before one can access them. You know, even once one has one's research permit to go to a particularly challenging archive, if you get there and there's no catalogue, um, and that's happened to well, many of us in this room, it becomes a very challenging place to work, very different to somewhere like the National Archives where everything is so beautifully presented to us. But should I pass that across to Sarah? Would you like to comment on, on that? I could say something. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think, um, I suppose, sort of building on what Claire was saying, I suppose my reflection on that is also about um, the things we help our students to do in understanding that curation and selection process and that being part of the way that um, project, I mean, sort of courses such as the one that Margot's doing, where it's actually m m helping students to meet uh, meet archivists and talk about the practice of how these things are very much are curated or the ones that are going to be digitized have been a selection and this was the rationale behind the selection which is online and making sure particularly that students are aware of where those selections have taken place and you know as most people um go entering archives you know your your first you know weeks are negotiating the catalog and spending a lot of time doing that and when your catalog you and it's very different when you do that via a web portal and you search term and you pull up your list and you've done it that way um you know, and, and you don't put, it does, it requires a different set of skills. And that's very much, I think, about why import, events like this are so important in communicating between making archivists and lecturers and the people who can support in skills-based um, teaching for students becomes very important and in allowing their 
them to think critically about how they are using different digital materials in the right way. Thanks very much. Um, I think it, um, how to curate colonial archives and, you know, in, uh, digitally, I think would, a lot would depend on um, uh, which colonial archives you're talking about and where. Um, because I think, I think the sort of very political nature of many of the um, archival materials which, which are contained in colonial collections around the world would, uh, I would imagine, in many places cause quite a big political problems um, of representations. And even, um, you know, the, one of the very famous cases of digitizing um, visual cultural materials uh, which, which caused this kind of um, problem uh, was the one um, undertaken by MIT. It, it's called Visualizing Cultures. And it was um, head, headed by a very famous historian of uh, modern Japan, uh, somebody called John Dara. And uh, he and a group of people at MIT, um, I think it was called a Visual Cultures Lab or something, they, they did this incredible um, source online which attempted to um, tell the history of, um, of Japan in this case through visual materials which were you know, uh, available to, uh, to John Dawa and, and the group there. And um, so we, you know, this was advertised on H Asia, and uh, we started using them as, as teaching materials. And because it was curated by John Dower, um, out of all people, he had incredibly great, you know, good text, and it was just perfect material to teach. But this became um, a point of great controversy with um, Chinese students who were studying uh, in the United States. And they said that the Japanese um, depictions of the Chinese, particularly um, on topics such as the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, um, were you know, damning to the Chinese and uh, pejorative and so on and so forth. And so they started this kind of big debate, which was really quite acrimonious. And um, in the end, um, I think uh, MIT felt that they, they sort of had to um, rewrite this project uh, so that it's going to, um, I mean, I thought the ones that I read, uh, that I saw, were actually very historically sensitive. Uh, but anyway, they, they had to tone down even more. So there is this uh, problem of, um, I think, was it, I think, Michael, you said that once it becomes di digitized, it, you know, the access, it means uh, uh, access to, to these materials would open up potential kind of political issues. And I think uh, particularly things like colonial archives and, you know, history of genocide and all sorts of um, sort of controversial historical topics um, need to be um, thought out really quite clearly and carefully um, uh, before, I think, turned into these materials. And I'm not saying that I'm against any of these things. I think it's a, a very important thing. But it seems that in, in certain um, topics and uh, materials, it, it does caught quite a lot of um, political controversy. <laughs> 